I recently attended five football games in five days in five different cities in four different leagues and four different levels of football in two different countries. This is my story. A week before I recorded this, I returned home after a life-changing football trip to England and Ireland, where I attended the following matches. Reading at Bolton on April 1st, Wrexham at Doncaster Rovers on April 2nd, Aston Villa at Manchester City on April 3rd, Sheffield United at Liverpool on April 4th, and Waterford at Bohemian on April 5th in Dublin. And in case you can't tell, my voice is a little raspy because I picked up something while I was over there. Nothing bad, but I could use the throat lozenge or two, so please hit that subscribe button so I can afford to buy a couple cough drops, please. Each game I went to offered a little something different, and each game had different stakes to it. In Bolton, the Wanderers are fighting for promotion, with each game critical to their promotion hopes, including this one. I did a video on their promotion chances late last week. You can check that out for further context. But I was in the Reading supporters section for this one, and what a way to have my first ever English football game in person in an away section. Reading fans were lively, but as the game got away from them, Bolton fans definitely made their voices heard. I also had my first ever football pie, a chicken balti, and it was pretty solid. Outside the grounds, I was impressed with Tough Sheet Stadium, or Reebok Stadium as the locals still call it. The club shop was nice, and the people I interacted with on both sides were lovely. A lot depends on whether people are confident enough to play for promotion or, or to hang on to the job or I, I, I'm not interested anymore I want out stability for me it's all about stability I mean um, we for, for me it, I don't ever want to be in this position again as a Reading supporter the problem is we've had dodgy Russians we've had dodgy Thais we've had dodgy Chinese so a few dodgy Saudis as long as I got some money, I don't really mind. Oh, and shout out to these Reading fans who didn't make my original video because for some reason their audio wasn't captured. If you know them or if you're one of them, feel free to drop a comment and say hi and please accept my apologies. Then it was off to Doncaster in South Yorkshire for some League 2 action between an underdog pulling off a Rocky Balboa act as we speak against Hollywood's darlings from Wales. Wrexham were fighting to retain a promotion slot while Doncaster is having a monumental late season surge that could see them squeak into the promotion playoffs. I'll be doing a video on that soon. Aaron Challoner and Danny Dickinson, two Rovers fans, were kind enough to show me around and give me background on the Rovers before the game. I got to meet a few Rovers players before and after the game and even got to see the stars of Wrexham come off the bus. That was pretty cool. I sat close to the Wrexham supporters and my God, were they allowed the whole game. I thought it was impressive, as we don't usually get that kind of fervent away support in MLS here in, in the States, except for a few exceptions, like my team in St. Louis. Now, the game itself, as fun of a 1-0 game as could be, as the Rovers frustrated Wrexham the whole game, and I got to see the Rovers get an upset win with this goal right in front of me. But then I got quite the culture shock the next day in Manchester, going from League Two to the tippy top of the Prem as third place Man City hosted fourth place Aston Villa. The place was pretty full and fans were engaged throughout. I had no real stakes in this one though. I tried to blend in with a Man City kid and a Holland scarf, although I do really enjoy watching Erling Holland as a player. The game itself was a quality affair, though I felt Villa was willing to concede this one due to injuries and fixture congestion. I also got to see my second hat trick of this trip, Phil Foden. Kind of ridiculous, guys. He's really good. Then it was to a place that I've wanted to be at for almost 20 years, Anfield. Now, full disclaimer, I am a Liverpool fan. I've been a Liverpool fan since the late 2000s, and this was a dream come true for me. And Anfield did not disappoint. It's still got the classic feel to it, although it has been modernized, and I just really enjoyed my time there. The seating was pretty cozy, but I didn't really care, and neither did anyone around me. As we belted out, you'll never walk alone. Uh, morning, I'm not exactly Andrea Bocelli.
Now, the game itself was a nervy affair as Liverpool struggled for 75 minutes to break through against bottom of the table Sheffield United. But when they did, pure elation. And then for the dessert after the main course, I hopped over to Dublin the next day for some League of Ireland action between Bowes and Waterford. Now, I always wanted to visit Daly Mound Park in its current form after seeing a few YouTube videos and articles about it. It's a literal football ruin with the terraces you can see on the far side of the pitch having been condemned since the 90s. The game itself was a 1-0 stinker that saw Bowes lose in its new gaffer's first match, but the fans around me were lovely including this absolute legend. And these guys I met before the game were lovely as well. It's fan owned, it's a, it's a family club. They're, they're just fantastic to, to support, you know. They do everything, they do a lot for, for charities and, and as you see, they do a lot for Palestine now at the minute as well, so. It's pretty cool. And it's just the, the fabric of, of what we are. Um, we don't win many trophies, but we're here for the right reason. We're here for football, and we're here to be part of something good. We try to do right by the community. We try to do right by society. I even had a fellow American with me to take in the action. Oh, I think it's great. It's in the neighborhood. Uh, it's actually a lot bigger than what I expected it. At the same time, it's all in. So, how would I rank? these five games. Well, before I go into my rankings, I do want to point out that I really enjoyed all five of them for different reasons. There was not a single bad experience that I had anywhere, and I did come away with a greater appreciation for this game that I am rapidly falling in love with. The passion for football in England is unmatched. We don't have anything like that here in America, even though we do try, and a lot of that passion for their teams rubbed off on me. Number five, Man City versus Aston Villa at the Etihad. I enjoyed the Etihad a lot. I went into it with low expectations. Maybe that helped, but perhaps I, since I didn't have any personal stakes in this one, this was probably the most casual of the five games for me, just as a fan of the game. It's a very impressive stadium, very impressive club. I still enjoyed it. Number four, Bohemian versus Waterford at Daly Mount Park. Now, this place had a unique character to it that I really can't explain, but I really dug the vibe of the place and of the club itself, which does so much for its community and it's still 100% fan-owned. The only thing that drags this down for me was the actual game itself. It was just kind of blah. Number three, Bolton versus Reading at Reebok Stadium. Now, this game was a blowout, uh, which you know, didn't, you know, help its score here. Um, and also it was a blowout that did not go the way of the team that I was there to support in Reading. But again, I really enjoyed the grounds and the fans I interacted with. It was a great introduction to English football for me. And now fans from both teams comprise a lot of my subscriber base. So welcome if you're from Bolton. Welcome if you're from Reading. I enjoyed um, Tup Sheet Community Stadium. I enjoyed meeting you guys. The fact that you're third on this list, don't take that as a slight at all because, again, I enjoyed all the places that I went to. Um, so thank you, Redding, and thank you, uh, Bolton Wanderer fans. Number two, Doncaster versus Wrexham at Eco Power Stadium. Now, who doesn't love a good underdog story? And I'm not talking about Wrexham in this instance. I really liked Eco Power Stadium. I love the community vibe around before and after the game, around the grounds, inside the stadium. And Doncaster fans I've dealt with have been absolutely lovely. I do consider myself a Rovers fan as well, though to a lesser degree uh, to Liverpool. We'll get to them here in just a little bit. Um, but I will be back in Doncaster at some point, and I will do some Rovers content on this channel. In fact, I've already done some Rovers content already. You can click up here to see my video that I did on this past uh, weekend's game against Accrington Stanley. I did that on my friend Charles' account. And number one, Liverpool versus Sheffield United at Anfield. Now, as a Red, going here was a dream come true, as I mentioned. There was almost no way Anfield was not going to be number one on this list. Again, no offense to any other clubs, but this was the main reason I came over and I was not disappointed. I was really impressed with Anfield. The crowd energy was lively throughout and I just had a great time overall. 
I really was impressed with the fan culture in England. There's a certain casualness to American sports over here, uh, except for soccer and maybe you see in the uh, college ranks. Um, but a lot of us just, you know, we buy a ticket, we go to a game, we sit down, we cheer, we boo, and then we go home and life goes on. Uh, but in football in England, in even Ireland to a degree, feels like so much more to people than what goes on with the pitch. It's a part of their identity. It's a part of their towns or city's identity. And the fans really around their club and they ebb and flow as they do. Um, the chanting is more spontaneous over there. They don't have any capos, as we call them over here. Nothing wrong with capos, by the way. Don't take that as a slight, you know, if you, um, you know, towards the capos over here in America or for St. Louis. Um, we, as an American sports fan base, we really do kind of need prompting and urging to uh, get lively and you know start chanting for our club over in England they have us beat by a century okay you know in terms of football tradition so we're getting there um, but I I was struck away uh, that you know really any chance that I heard were 100% spontaneous and yet I I also was really struck by how many of you in England actually care what I have to say about your game. After all, to me, England is the cradle of the game itself. I mean, there's I, I don't deny that one bit. In fact, it took an Englishman to introduce the game here in St. Louis. And we here in St. Louis call ourselves America's soccer capital, as you can see in my uh, scarf back here. Um, we call ourselves America's soccer capital, and we wouldn't even call ourselves that if it wasn't for an Englishman in the late 1800s that introduced the game to us. So respect to you, England, for bringing us this game. And yet the great majority of you that I have interacted with over there as well as online on my YouTube channel both are very curious what I have to say um, and actually very supportive on my thoughts on the game, which I still consider to be developing a little bit. I've been I've been a fan of soccer for a couple of decades, but definitely more of a casual fan uh, up until recently. And I've been very appreciative of your feedback um, when I talk about the game. I appreciate your feedback when I get pronunciations wrong. Um, English um, people have a different way of pronouncing like city names, for instance or team names like Peter Bruh, you know, instead of Peter Burrow, you know, stuff like that. Um, but you guys have been helpful on that, and I really do thank you, and I'll, I'll try to do better. Okay, menu prices. Food and drink at English football games is ridiculously cheap. Now, I had an idea of that going into this because I follow Foodie Scran on Twitter, but seeing it with my own eyes was just mind-blowing. I feel we get gouged for concession prices here in America. Like a chicken sandwich, for instance, over here might cost $15. And that might be for a cheaper sandwich. Um, a uh, bottle of beer would cost about $12 at City Park. Whereas over, over there, a pint's like five pounds. Uh, which, by the way, the pound is a little um, stronger than the American dollar. Like, like for one U.S. dollar, it's 80 pence over there. So... Um, um, so the gap is, but even still the gap, you know, $5 for a pint versus $12 for like a 12 ounce beer over here. It's, it's mind blowing to me. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I envy you guys in England for your, your menu prices. I really do. Another thing you guys have over there that we don't in America are these fabulous game day programs. Now, again, you might be looking at me right now weird and because you probably just this is one of those things that over there you probably just take for granted. Like, you know, what's, what's this guy talking about programs? I mean, really? What, who cares about programs? Well, we don't have these type of programs here in America. Um, in St. Louis, we basically get like a pamphlet and I'll show you one right now. Now, this is a pamphlet that you get at a St. Louis City SC game. Now, granted, it is free, but basically all it is is it folds up. You can see ads, a lot of ads. You do get a uh, club roster on one side here, but the rest of this is just ads. And then you flip it around on the other side and you just get, you know, you get the front page, you get the schedule. Then you just get more ads. 
But then the value of these programs is that they do open up to a uh, poster of a city player. And that's basically it. We don't have anything like the programs that you do in England, which to me almost read like love letters to the supporters. Like they always have the manager writing a quick article, welcoming people to the stadium. You know, here's where things stand. You might have the chairman chiming in on things or a former player. Um, you'll have photos of fans, stats, um, just the whole gamut. I'm really impressed by programs in England. And again, it's probably one of those things that you guys just take for granted and you're wondering why I'm even belaboring this point um, but you just saw the programs we have over here in america little lacking like i would happily pay four or five bucks a game uh, over here for a program like you guys have because they're really good keepsakes they're good time capsules and uh with physical tickets dying out over there as well as over here as well um we need more things to remember the games that we go to. Like, I will always have, um, you know, like, the Bose uh, scarf over here. I remember I always bought that from the game. The Doncaster, I bought that at the Doncaster Wrexham game. The Jurgen Klopp scarf, I bought in a, a little store in a shopping mall the day before the game. Y you get the idea. Now, this was the most divisive thing among English natives that I encountered over there. You guys don't like your train system at all. Um, I heard things like that it's unreliable, that the trains break down, they're expensive, which I got a thing to say about that, and that, you know, the conductors and engineers often go on strike. Um, and it's all fair things, all fair complaints, but everything is relative. Here in America, we don't have anything like your train system in England, and I am effing jealous of you guys badly um we have one national city to city train company called amtrak and they suck we sold out to the car companies back in the 50s and we dismantled our passenger rail system we took down all of our street cars and we just worshiped the car gods over here so amtrak uses freight lines to get around, which means that there's always delays. Uh, they have very limited routes. Like I can't even get to like a Louisville or an Indianapolis, which is just four hours away directly on Amtrak. That's how pathetic our passenger rail system is here in America. I wish we had something like you guys have in England. I am so fucking envious of you guys and i i'm using strong language there because i would give anything to have your train system to be able to you know pull out uh you know 10 10 pound you know a 10 pound bill and be able to be you know hours away in a different city i would kill for that here in america like for real but all in all, I really love my time in England and Ireland. The people were great. The games were amazing. The food was okay. I mean, I you know, fish and chips were good. Um, and Indian food was good. But let's face it, people don't go to England and Ireland for the food. I mean, I think you guys would even admit that as well. But I came away with a new appreciation for this game as well as your culture. And I will definitely be back in England and Ireland someday. This is That's a non-negotiable. This was my favorite vacation I've ever taken, and I want to do it again at some point, hopefully sooner than later, but it's not the cheapest to fly over from America to uh, London. It's, it's at least a grand, no matter how you look at it, going, going at least, I mean, one way it's about $700, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I have to plan and save for maybe next season, We'll see. But um, I want to thank you for uh, entertaining the silly American while I was over there and the silly dream of being in your country and going to your matches. A lot of you have also decided to subscribe to this channel so much that 1,000 subscribers is within reach with your help. I have less than 150 to go at the time of this recording. So hit that subscribe button if you want to see more American perspectives on the game you love. I'm your soccer zombie, Tom Franklin, and hey, look at that. I've gone ahead and made a playlist of all five games that I went to during my speed run. This is actual proof that I had fun in your country. So watch them if you want to see an American having fun in your country.